when it comes to the issue of the image of the beast, which the Bible talks about the followers of Antichrist bowing to, it is important that we stay away from uh, exaggerated uh, fairy tales that we all see on the media or the internet. Lazarium shows and Star Trek, many prophecy analysts attempt to take the passage of Revelation 13, 15, literally. Thus, many are expecting the Antichrist to produce a literal animated statue or an image that will speak, which everyone will be commanded to bow to. After all, he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused it to worship the image to be killed. Well, this is not a Lazarian show, but we need to understand in context what it means. But whenever one interprets a passage that was intended to be allegorical or an allegorical passage that is intended to be interpreted literally, they have fallen prey to a common pitfall. We have to be careful when we look at things allegoric that we interpret them as such and lit not literalize allegories. In seeing these absurdities we read in the internet, we can see the need to dig deeper into the allegoric meaning of certain passages in the Bible. So how are we to understand this passage then? He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. The obvious interpretation is that the prior beast kingdom that was wounded shall come back to life again. This is simply a revival of the wounded kingdom, not an individual person. So this is not speaking of an individual, but an entire entity and an empire. When we examine scripture, first we must commit ourselves to some deeper investigation, and then we must allow the Bible to interpret itself. The concept of reviving and creating an image of the beast is something that the scriptures give us ample information to understand properly. If we search through the Bible for various usages of the word image, we will gain significant insight into the nature of what this passage is actually talking about. There are several aspects to the meaning of this image. The Bible describes an image, for example, as a religious or national symbol set up in the temple. Quote, for the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or an image. Hosea 3, 4. When Israel was destroyed as a kingdom, it lost everything. It lost its centralized national religious institution with the destruction of the temple. That will be the sacrificial system and the ephod. And also lost its national symbols, the Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, and the rest of the temple articles. Islam also has a temple for Allah, the Kaaba, along with the temple articles, the black stone, as well will this be discussed more in detail later. Jehovah's Temple articles in Jerusalem were a shadow of a greater things to come, the Messiah in this case. Why Allah's Temple articles, the black stone, resembles a shadow of Satan's coming, the Antichrist. An image also could represent an idol, a medium, if you will, that represents a living being. One could erect an idol to a god. King Nebuchadnezzar erected a massive image, a dead idol of himself, and demanded all of his subjects to bow and worship it. This is an example of idolatry. This could easily apply to Satan as well, who is called Baal or Bel or Baal Zabub in the Bible. One could erect an image of Baal or Satan that would serve as a medium and a representation of Satan worship. This type of image is not restricted to a statue, however. It can even be a stone, such as the black stone meteorite in the Kaaba in Mecca. A great example of this is a quote from the Bible itself. Quote, 
At last, the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Acts chapter 19, verse 35. The image of Diana was not represented by a statue, but by a black stone which was worshipped in Ephesus, identified as the image of Diana. Yet these images are all symbolic of Satan worship. Quote, what say I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 19 to 20. Satan sets up idols as representations of himself until he comes down to earth and establishes himself as the Antichrist in human form. Islam wants to destroy every image that represents Jehovah. This is why Muslims want to destroy Jewish and Christian symbols. But the reason that Muslims desire to destroy Christian and Jewish images is because Islam desires to destroy Christianity and Judaism altogether. According to Islamic tradition, when Jesus returns, he does not merely come to convert most Christians to Islam, but to literally abolish Christianity as we know it today. This fact is understood when we analyze a very well-known tradition which states that when Jesus returns, he will, quote, break the cross, kill swine, and abolish jizya. Allah will perish all religions except Islam, end of quote. So while Islamic tradition claims that Jesus will return and destroy all symbols of Christianity, there are also significant parallels in Psalm 83 and Judges chapter 821 that say he will in fact destroy the symbols of none other but Islam. In Psalm 82 to 83, the Bible says there will be a war between Messiah and the Antichrist. The Gideon Messiah or war Messiah will come to rescue Israel. He will carry out an important task due to them as you did to Midian, as you did to Sisera and Jabin at the river of Kishon, who perished at Ain Dur and become like refuse on the ground, make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, and their princes like Zibah and Zalmunna, who said, let us take possession of the pastor land of God. Psalm 83, 9-12. After listing several Muslim nations that form an end-time alliance to destroy Israel, the psalmist prays, make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, ye, all their princes, as Zibah and Zalmunna. But what happened in the story of Zibah and Zalmunna? The answer is found in Judges chapter 8, verse 21, quote, Then Zibah and Zalmunna said, Rise yourself and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength, and Gideon arose and slew Zibah and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Later, in fact, in verse 26, the Bible says that the Midianite kings were wearing the same crescent ornaments around their necks. After Gideon stripped all of the crescent ornaments off of the slain kings, the people, and the camels, he melted the gold. In reality, the story of Gideon is the story of Messiah. He is a parallel of the Messiah, and the Messiah will do the same as Gideon did. It is also the story of David and Goliath, parallel to the showdown between Christ and Antichrist, who blasphemes the God of Israel and proclaims, I am against you, most hafty one. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 31. David, with precision bombing, lodges a stone into Goliath's forehead. This is what happens to Babylon and the Antichrist, quote, their arrows shall be like those of an expert warrior. Furthermore, none shall return in vain. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 9. 
This is modern precision bombing. Not a single missile will miss its target. Bel, the moon god, will also be destroyed and all the idols of the crescent moon taken away. The Bible even quotes it. Bel is shamed. Murdoch is broken in pieces. Her idols are humiliated. Her images are broken in pieces. Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 2. Bel or Baal, the cult of the crescent moon, is finally destroyed. While Muslims deny they have that cult, they link to it in many forms, which we will discuss later. Bel has always been symbolized by the crescent moon. In Judges 8.21, the word used for crescent is saharon, which literally means crescent moon. It comes from the root of sahar, which is literally used for the name of Satan in Isaiah 14, Hilal ben sahar. Even the word Hilal or Hilal is the word that the King James Bible translates as Lucifer. The full phrase actually means morning star, crescent moon which is the very symbol of Islam. In other words, while Muslims deny that they worship Baal, they cannot deny that these symbols come from the ancient Baal worship. The symbol of Islam and the name of Satan are one and the same. This is significant and is a very clear hint into the spiritual origin of Islam and the Antichrist. So we see that the ancient enemies of Israel worshipped a god that was symbolized by the image of the crescent moon. To this day, this has not changed. In fact, all evidence points to the fact that Allah is simply another name for Bel or Baal, which simply means Lord, and is also a title for reverence to the Babylonian moon god. The Romans had the same god, and so did the Greeks, who worshipped Gog or Gyges a war deity called Men. Well, that's where we get the word Moon. This is also the God that Abraham left behind for Jehovah, the one true God. It comes as no surprise then that Jesus referred to Satan as Baal Zebub, or the Lord of the Flies in Matthew 12. The Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics confirms the fact that the Arab name Allah correlates to Baal, and I quote, Allah is a pre-Islamic name corresponding to the Babylonian god known as Bel. Gideon was named as Jerubal, the one who contends with Baal, the moon god. Gideon was a type of the warring messiah because he fought Baal. Likewise, Christ, the ultimate Jerubal, will fight Baal in the flesh and bruise his head completing what was promised in Genesis 3.15. Dr. Arthur Jeffrey, professor of Islamic and Middle Eastern studies at Columbia University and one of the world's foremost scholars on Islam, wrote that the name Allah and its feminine form, Allat, were well known in pre-Islamic Arabia and were found in inscriptions uncovered in North Africa. According to Jeffrey's Allah, is a proper name applicable only to their peculiar God. He adds, Allah is a pre-Islamic name corresponding to the Babylonian God known as Bel. Bel simply means Lord, and this is a title for reverence to the moon god Sin. The great idol of Islam, the Black Stone, and its veneration has been around from time immemorial. Yet despite the very clear correlations, few prophecy analysts have ever linked this to what has already been spoken of in the book of Acts. Everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis whose image fell down to us from heaven, Acts 19.35. The image of Artemis is strikingly similar to the meteorite stone image in Mecca, which Allah commands 1.3 billion Muslims to literally bow down and prostrate themselves towards at least 17 times during their five daily prayers. John of Damascus, who lived at the advent of Islam, 
and served in the court of the Caliph and was thoroughly familiar with Islam from its inception, writes in his work concerning heresy, quote, So then these were idolaters and reverenced the morning star and Aphrodite, who they indeed named Akbar in their own language, which means great. The Islamic connection to Aphrodite is evident in the Muslim cry, Allahu Akbar, Allah is great. Aphrodite is actually a lat, the feminine root of the name Allah. Even the Greek historian Herodotus, writing in the 5th century BC, considers a lat the equivalent of Aphrodite. Quote, the Assyrians call Aphrodite Milita, and the Arabians al Ilat. The pre Islamic Arabs believed a lat resided in the Kaaba and also had an idol for her inside the sanctuary. Quote, the Quraysh, as well as all the Arabs, were wont to venerate a lat. They also used to name their children after her, calling them Zaydul Lat and Taymil Lat. Even the Bible confirms this style of naming. The name Sanbal Lat in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 19 is a derivative of two words, Sin, the moon god, and Alat, Aphrodite, the feminine of Allah and one of the three daughters. Such names existed long before Muhammad, whose father's name, Abdullah, meaning the slave of Allah, the moon god. Sanballat was known to have harassed Israel as they were attempting to build the temple alongside with Tobia, the Ammonite, and Gesham, the Arab. Nothing has changed. Today, these same people with an evolved form of the same religion still harass Israel and are the main obstacle to the rebuilding of the temple. But what is the whole thing about venerating an asteroid? What is this whole image about? Does the Bible warn us of this? The Bible is so clear in exposing this issue. Jehovah simply wants us to dig deeper. Lucifer's image is depicted in Revelation 8 and 9, showing Satan wanting to be worshipped. He is a star that fell from heaven, quote, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, Revelation 9 verse 1. This him cannot be an object as a star, but rather Satan himself, a living being, him, cast out of heaven as described in Isaiah 14 and Revelation 8 verse 10. The important verse in the Quran that describes Allah is perfectly mirrored in Isaiah 14. In Isaiah 14, it is Satan or Lucifer that is described as the bearer of light. And in the Quran, it is Allah that is depicted as the lamp, light, or torch. In the chapter of the star in the Quran, we read, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. A likeness of his light is as a niche in which is a lamp. The lamp is a glass, and the glass is as it were brightly shining star. Quran 24, 35 to 36. Now compare this with Revelation 8 verse 10, quote, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Take note of the fact that the death of one third of the earth's population occurs during the rise of the Eighth Empire, which will be an Islamic empire. Satan, who is the fallen star in this case, and the destroyer who is unleashed, will precede the mountain or empire that will cause one-third of mankind to die spiritually. The black stone of Mecca owns its reputation to the tradition that it fell from the heavens, like the black stone of Aphrodite. The black stone of Mecca is also clearly an image of Satan. Yet this satanic image that is created by the beast in Revelation 13, 15, which can speak and cause all who do not worship it to be killed, 
it is mentioned as a holy thing by Muhammad in an Islamic tradition authenticated by a Tirmidhi. Allah will raise up the stone, the black stone on the day of judgment and it will have two eyes with which it will see and a tongue which it talks with and it will give witness in favor of everyone who touched it in truth. According to Muslim traditions, the black stone is even the redeemer of Muslims. A Tirmidhi notes that many years ago the black stone was, quote, whiter than milk. It was only later that it became black as it absorbed the sins of those who touched it. The blasphemy does not stop here. The black stone or the black rock, the image of Satan, the fallen star, which attempts to take the place of Christ, the great redeemer, is called by Muhammad, the son of perdition, Yaminullah. This means that it is the right hand of Allah with which he touches his servants. It is the visible right hand of the invisible Allah, according to Islam. It is even the Shekinah glory which dwells in all believers. Venerating it and rotating seven times around it will cleanse the Muslim of all prior sins in accordance to Islam. The veneration of Satan through this act of rotating around an idol image is even alluded to in the Bible and rarely understood by many analysts. In Ezekiel chapter 31 verse 3 declares, Behold, the Assyrian, in this case the Antichrist, Satan, in the flesh, was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches, and with a shadowing shroud, and of high stature, and his top was among the thick buffs. The waters made him great, the deep set him up on high, with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. If we exercise what we learn from the previous part, we can apply what we learn in the following interpretive paraphrase. Behold, Satan, a beautiful angel clothed in beautiful covering, an angel with high status, peoples and multitudes from every nation made him great and the underworld set him up high with the multitudes running round about his idol and sent out the people to all the idols that were set forth for him. This is exactly what we see in the Muslim Hajj, which Muslims do yearly to have their sins forgiven by the right hand of Allah, which is the black stone. They come from all over the world to the Kaaba and roam round about it. In addition, Jeremiah 51 verse 44 tells us, quote, I will punish Bel in Babylon, and I will bring out of his mouth what he has swallowed, and the nations shall not stream to him anymore. Wow. The nations will not flock to Babylon, and Bel, the moon god, will be ashamed in her. No longer will the nations flock to Mecca to worship Satan. This punishment is not a historic one. It refers to Jerusalem and the invasion of the Temple Mount. Strangers have come into the sanctuaries of the Lord's house, Jeremiah 51, 51. In the last days, there will be two opposing houses, one dedicated to Jehovah and the other to Satan.